could preach on for days. We're rolling? Thank you. Um, okay, turn to Acts chapter 14 and turn to Ecclesiastes, if you will, please. Go back to Ecclesiastes and turn to chapter 9. Ecclesiasticus, back here somewhere. There it is. When you compare Ecclesiastes to the book of Ephesians, you're going to be comparing uh, the difference between a man who lived under the sun, the natural man, in this particular case it's King Solomon, but he is uh, a saved guy. Uh, but he is still looking at things in the world as a natural man. He looks at things as he does under the sun, as human beings look at things, okay, the worldly view, in other words. In Ephesians, you're looking at things what? You're not looking at things under the sun anymore. You're looking at things from what, what, what attitude are you looking at it from? You're looking at it from a slightly elevated attitude. That's why we call it... Uh, getting the bird's eye view, let me get this up here, you're looking at things above the sun, where is the Lord Jesus Christ right now, is he under the sun or is he above the sun, everybody's listening to what he says under the sun over here right now, the, 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 the red letter stuff here over here that we talked about before, but really he's here, he's been exalted, he's been He's resurrected, he's been glorified, he's ascended, he's exalted far above all principalities and powers. This is where he is now, this is where he gives the information to Paul, and now we're going to go to an elevated position, an advanced position of knowing who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and that's how we're going to look at evangelism. The message that we preach today about evangelism is not a carryover from this period during the Gospels. As I told you before, they don't have the Gospel of Grace over here. Their message does not contain the blood of Jesus Christ. It does not contain the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, how you can say you're preaching the Gospel with this particular message, I have no idea. Okay, But what I, what I do find, and I shared this with a man on Thursday, when I showed him some things in Luke 9, he had never looked at that that way before because all he knew is it was the gospel. But what is the gospel? We talked about that on the first sheet that I gave you, the introduction sheet to this. Uh, and if you don't have one, I'll get you one. The, uh, the introduction sheet has a list of gospels that I want you to study. And in that list, you're going to find out that there are many, many different messages and many, many different opportunities for people throughout God's program to get saved. And they're not all the same message. These messages vary. God did not give the gospel of grace to Noah. He did not give the gospel of grace to Moses. Moses was saved when? When was he saved? Before the law was given. Okay. So during these periods back here, David being under the law, Moses before the law, uh, Abraham's, uh, Isaac, or, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob before the law, Noah certainly before them, antediluvian, he's before the flood. All these people had messages from God. And all these people had messages that they could believe and obey and trust. They were all good news. When Abraham heard the gospel, what gospel did he hear? That's always a good question, isn't it? When you go to Galatians, you find it that, the, the, that God preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Well, what did he preach to Abraham that was such good news? Was it, was it that Jesus Christ died on the cross for his sins? No. Was it that Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross for his sins? No. That had nothing to do with it. So when God gives you good news, you can rejoice in that good news at that time, and whatever God says to you at that time, you believe it. And when Abraham believed it, what happened? It was counted to him for righteousness. That was in Genesis 15. Actually, that was probably in Genesis 12. But there are some confusing issues here. And so what we want to do is straighten that out. We're going to talk about this. Today, we're going to talk about the expansion of evangelism in such a way that builds on a foundation. Evangelism begins first. First is evangelism. That's the point, the, the, that's the point message of everything we have. Then edification, which is the building up of the saints so that they know what to say when they go out to evangelize. And then what? Expansion. You know, when you're in business and you're going to expand, 
Most people expand because they want to expand. They want to make more money, they want to get bigger, they want to do a lot of things, and they expand their business. There's a formula in business that you use in order to expand, and if it's not the right time and your finances are not in the right place and you don't have the, right, the correct financing in terms of credit and, and cash flow and so forth, you don't expand. You don't expand just because you decide to, you see. Things get busy, you don't go hire people, okay? You just work harder, okay? And, and so then what happens is if it continues in a, in a particular, for a particular time and you look at the trends and you look and see what happens and you look at contracts and you look at commitments and so forth, then you start hiring people. But there are times to expand, there are times not to expand. In evangelism, you do not expand when you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? You don't get people saved and then send them out to do the work of the ministry. The work of evangelism is not for babes. The work of evangelism is for soldiers. It's not for babes. Babes can be a part of it, and they can watch it. They can be a part of it, and they can learn. But when they do not understand the gospel of grace and they do not understand the message of grace, they will do more harm than good. And they'll do that by going out and preaching over here where they live in the dispensation of grace the wrong message. Now, that's dangerous. And if you don't think so, talk to people in Christendom because they're, they're preaching this false message everywhere. Is this message a gospel over here? Yes. Is it a bona fide message from God? Yes. Is it a false gospel today? Yes, it is. And it's false not because of its content or its intent. It's false because God's not talking about it anymore. It's the message changed. How many, of, how many of you have ever wanted to sit down and read a newspaper when you didn't read it online? But how many of you always wanted a current newspaper? You want to see what today's weather is. If you're looking for a job, do you want a week old paper? If you're going to look in the want ads, no. If you're going to look for something in, in the uh, classified section that's for sale, you don't look at last week's paper, it'll be gone. Whatever's in there is going to be gone. So what you do is you get a current paper, right? You get today's paper, and you look at it, and you learn what God's doing today. Um, people are always wanting to know what the will of God is and how to put the will of God into their life or how to learn the will of God for their life. And the, the standard answer to all this is learn the will of God first because he's revealed it. That's what he's been doing since he was resurrected up here. He's been revealing the will of God to Paul. Now, that, that only took place over a period of about 35 years, and it's done. But we have the product of those 35 years in Romans to Philemon. So everything that Jesus Christ ever wanted you to hear or learn about himself first is right here. And then the rest of it, you learn this. So you see the safety in that, understanding who you are and what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to preach the gospel and what it does for you and what it does in your life. And then going back here and examining everybody else's material, very safe. Very important. That begins for you, by the way, in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Israel's past, Israel's present, Israel's future. And when you begin to learn about Israel's past, present, and future, it, you begin to, to, to distinguish it between what's going on now, and you realize that, hey, that's not for me. That's not to me. It can be for you, yes, but it's not to you directly. That's why we put this here. To us, for us, over here is for us too. So we're to learn about this. And we're to learn about this. Paul tells us to. But right now, we're to learn this first so that we don't go out preaching the wrong message. And we're going to get into some things here that are... Turn to Ecclesiastes. We're going to get into some things that, that have to do with wasting opportunity. Uh, the question is to serve or not to serve. When I was growing up, uh, when I was a young man, uh, in high school, the Vietnam War was raging. And the big fall of Saigon took place in like 75, 76 in that area. When, uh, when we pulled out and left all those people to the North uh, Vietnamese, to the communists, they came in and we were gone. Now we fought a 10,000 day war over there. We started it. The war started in 1945, by the way. But we didn't get into it till 60 something, 63, whatever. But there was a 10,000-day war that took place, and in those days, it was the communist against the non-communist aggression. Well, when the whole thing was over and Mr. Nixon decided to pull us out, you know what happened? The people there got overran. I met some of those people in my store. I met a family who was over there, and they got out. I met a guy here 
a few years ago I did some work for and, and he went out on one of the last transports that went out. And I'm going to tell you, he said it was a horrible sight. And all the things he said he saw in Vietnam the whole time he was there, leaving all those men, men women, and children to those communists was the worst thing he'd ever seen. When I was growing up, it was to serve or not to serve. People were burning their draft cards. They were going to Canada. They were, they were rebelling in the streets because they didn't want to fight this war. Okay, And there is a difference in this book right here between a just war and an unjust war. And you can learn that. Okay. The United States has yet to learn that lesson, but that's the way it is, okay? Well, you don't have that option today to serve or not to serve, okay? The, the issue today is in the Army, in the Air Force, in the Marine Corps, in the Navy, we have a completely voluntary service. So, yes, you can serve or choose not to serve today. It's all voluntarily. But there's no draft. But in the body of Christ, there is a draft. And as soon as you get saved, you're in. And you're under God's calling now, and so you're in whether you like it or not. Once you get saved, you're in the body of Christ, and you're in the army now, as they say. <laughs> so it's time, okay, to serve, and you can either serve or not serve. So here's what Ecclesiastes says. Look at verse 10, uh, chapter 9, verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Now that's the man under the sun's view about what goes on in the grave. What do people think happened when you die? Nothing. You're dead. Nothing's going on down there. Are they, are they talking about annihilation? Most of them are. What Solomon's talking about is not annihilation. He's talking about you're no longer doing anything in the grave like you're doing it now. You're not alive. You're dead. Now, you're going to go to paradise, you're going to go to torments, but either way, you're not going to be here doing what you're doing. Everything he's writing about in Ecclesiastes has to do with his entire life. He had it all, he did it all, he spent it all. He would had everything that any man could ever want to have, he blew it. And he left it all to two kids that should have been put in prison, okay? And the whole problem is life under the sun and life living in the flesh, and life living in the world, well, it has its disappointments, doesn't it? He lived in the greatest period of Israel's history for 40 years. He lived in a period and ruled over a kingdom that is a mock-up of uh, what we would call a foretaste of what's going to happen right here. 40 years, no wars. 40 years in which silver was considered nothing, like a paper cup like a solo cup, okay? Nothing. So if you got silver, that doesn't mean anything, okay? Gold was the issue then because Solomon had so much of it and Israel had so much of it that they did so much that you cannot comprehend what this man did. If you read his exploits, you will see he had it all, he did it all, he lost it all. And when he said he, he was doing all this, he says, why am I doing this? I'm just going to leave it. It's all for me. He built palatial homes for heathen women all over Israel. And they set up their own little miniature temples in their homes and in their place. He built them gardens. He built them all kinds of wonderful things. And what happened is they just brought idolatry and the seeds of it into Israel. It was from that reign of 40 years that they went to Babylon for 70 years because of idolatry. Now, as you look at how Israel goes from being in this position to where they could have served the Lord to going down into a, a situation of, of, of almost like being in a prison in Babylon, they were captivity, in captivity. You see something interesting in this passage. Look at verse 11. He says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, neither bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor of men to, uh, to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Time and chance. What does Paul say in Philemon when he's talking about one of his friends? Look over at Philemon with me, if you will. He's talking about moving men around in the ministry. Moving this man over here, moving that man over there. He has confidence in the men he's working with. They're going to they're gonna help him. They're working with him in the ministry. He's working out an issue between Philemon and Onesimus in this letter. And in verse 21, he says, Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee 
knowing that thou wilt do more than I say. And he goes on, and he says, but with, but with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. And as you go through this, you, you realize that he's got things going on in the work of the ministry, and, and, and he's moving men around. He's making conscious decisions with his own free will of what's going on in the ministry. This is not God moving things around. This is God choosing an apostle and letting him make those decisions. Look over at verse 15. Philemon 15, 115. He says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, talking about Onesimus, that thou shouldest receive him forever. So Onesimus flees his master Philemon, possibly stealing something from him, taking whatever he needed, whatever. He leaves. He goes out into the world system. He gets in trouble. He finds himself in prison. And who's there with him? Paul. Paul leads him to Christ. They both know Philemon pretty well, okay? So Paul writes this love letter back to Philemon. And it's, it's the capstone of Paul's epistles because it's only 25 verses, but it's all about forgiveness. Every, all the, the whole thing is about forgiveness. And he wants Philemon to take Onesimus back and treat him like a brother now because he's no longer a slave. He's a brother. Now, when you have opportunity in life, what should you do? Is it to serve or not to serve? You don't have a choice. You really don't. But you do. And people don't want to take that choice. Soul winning is a labor of love. It is not for babes. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. There are three things in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 that demonstrate what a mature believer is. This is just one of many places. When a person gets established in the faith and they grow and they become a mature believer, here's what you're going to see them look like right here. Look what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing, notice three of them here, your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. What does, what does faith do for you? It'll cause you to go out and do the work of the ministry. If you love the lost, what will it cause you to do? It will cause you to labor to get them saved and to build them up in the faith when they do get saved. And when it comes to your life, which, by the way, Paul says is not your own anymore, what does the patience of hope do? It puts you focused on the thing you should be patient in. What is that? It's the patient waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not you being antsy about all the things you don't get to do in life. It's all the things you want to go after and can't get, all the things you're chasing and can't catch. It's not about that. It's about the patient waiting for Christ because that is the time in which you are recognized by God for what you do. Right here. Here it is. And the question isn't going to be how big did your business get or how many ladies did you get to marry or how many whatever it is that you thought you accomplished in life. The issue has to do with what? What did you preach? Now, if you preach the right message from the right book in the right spirit and you do it in this particular dispensation of grace where we live, you know what will happen to you? You're going to get pecked on. I mean, you're going to get pecked on hard. And... The only thing you can do in that situation is put your shields up. That's it. You know what it, you know you know what it you know what happens when you put your shields up? You're getting ready to fight. What happens when people get ready to fight? They go. <laughs> they don't stand there and say that, you know. They say put them up, man, because the shields have to go up because you're not considered what you thought of yourself earlier in life is not how God considers you now. He calls you to be a soldier. And he tells you not to run away from the hardness and cry to him to take it away. He says, endure it. Endure the, the tribulation. Go over to 2 Thessalonians and look what ha was happening to them. 2 Thessalonians, he writes back to the Thessalonians about the 
the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians is about the rapture and the coming of Jesus Christ for you. And 2 Thessalonians is about the second coming of Jesus Christ according to prophecy. And it's not about his coming for you. It's about his coming to Israel and destroy the world kingdoms. The, the, the Gentiles kingdoms of this world. Now, he makes two books available to you, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. They both have to do with the comings of Christ, and this particular coming here is a secret coming. It's not prophesied. This one is totally prophesied. This one, a man preached who was the ninth man from Adam preached that, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, I think it was. And he preached the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's a fascinating thing. And you say, wow, that's all the way back there? Oh, it is. And they wanted to kill him so bad that God had to pick him up and put him somewhere else. Now, if I take a word out of one language and pick it up and take it over here and put it into another language, what do they call that? That's called a translation, right? What, did, what does it say that Enoch, what happened to Enoch? He was what? He was translated. People say he was taken to heaven. No, he was picked up from here, and he was put over here somewhere else where he could preach, okay? He was preaching it. He was preaching just like Noah that followed him. They were preaching, and they were preaching about things that God told them to preach about, and they weren't in a mindset that's, well, you know, I'll do it if I get time. So I'll do it, you know. I, 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 yeah, I've had people say, well, I, I'm, I love Jesus. I, he's, you know, I want to I be a part of him. You know, I said, we well, were already a part of him. The question is, you get a hold of the message, right? You get a hold of this message. That's the first step. But eventually, by faith, when you really put your teeth into it, something fascinating happens. This message gets a hold of you. And when it gets a hold of you, then you can't do anything but talk about it. That's it. You can't not talk about it. It's impossible. You might run away for a while from it. You might try to get out of what you were going to do, but I'm going to tell you, career, forget it. This is your career. <laughs> Paul says in Ephesians 1, he says, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Your vocation is not what you do for a living. That's your avocation. And when you get tired of your avocation, you take a vacation from it, okay? Your vocation your training, what God has called you to do, is to preach this message. And he wants every person, man, woman, and child, he wants them to preach this message right here. And it is a direct mandate from Jesus Christ to all the nations of the earth. You'll find that in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 16. At the beginning of Romans, at the end of Romans. It is for the obedience of all nations, he says. And here is the apostle of the nations that carries that message. Unfortunately, Christum, Christendom is so sick and weak in this whole thing that they don't recognize not only their savior, nor his servant. They do not know who he is. If you go to Romans chapter 1 and look at the first verse of that book of Romans you will see a fascinating, a very, very interesting introduction. That verse I was just talking about is verse 5. But verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now that's sanctification unto a purpose in which God has called you. That's what sanctification is. Now if you look at verse 3, skip verse 2 for a second. He says, he's, you're separated... He's separated unto the gospel of God. And in verse 3, he says, what? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel to Paul is all about. It's about concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He says that he was called by God to reveal his son in me. And he says there in verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. It's the same Jesus Christ who was crucified at Calvary. It's not a fictitious other Jesus or another Jesus that you see around you. When do you see another Jesus pop up in the United States? When do you see that? You see it at Easter and you see it at Christmas, don't you? Christmas and Easter, you start seeing a fictitious baby image that has absolutely nothing to do with what's happening here, but has to do with something that happened back here 
to a completely different group of people that now live over here. So when you drive down, like I drive down my street during Christmas and I see the plastic manger and I see the, the authentic looking real manger. <laughs> At Disney they had a, a, a nativity over there. It was really interesting. We laughed so hard. I got a picture of it. But it was, uh, it had all these lights and all this stuff and it was flashing to the music. Dee, 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 this music was going. <laughs> I said, I'm thinking of peanuts, right? You know, the commercialization of Christmas. It's run by an Eastern syndicate. <laughs> they take it, and what do they do? I mean, you know, lights, music, okay, hot chocolate. Everybody's having fun. That's one thing. But when they, they over in the corner, they put the nativity, well, life-size, by the way, and it's got the disco look to it, okay? All of a sudden, you think you want to see one of those shepherds, and he's going like this, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Jesus Christ is not to be mocked that way. He's to be understood as who he is. I can tell you, over here, he wasn't laughing. Over here, he's not laughing. Okay? Now, we make jokes about it or laugh about it because that's what man does with things. He takes something perfectly righteous and solemn, and what does he do? He messes it up. That's what he's done with the gospel. The most important thing a human being ever hears in his life is the gospel of grace. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, 95% of the preachers in Pinellas County, they don't understand what we're talking about. Some of them do. Some of them are carrying old Schofield Bibles like I do. It's all right here, okay? But they don't, they don't preach it the way they should. You know why? No money in this. See, the, the way that you get money is you extort it from people. Pressure them. Put them under law. Make them feel guilty. Make them give. Extortion. Paul says don't eat with an extortioner. Those who put pressure on people to make them do things are legalists. Get away. If you go through Paul's epistles and look at all the things he tells you to get away from people for, oh, it's amazing. You say, well, who's left? The saints. And the saints that do that are wonderfully blessed in Christ Jesus, not just because they have it all already and they know it, but because of their, they're part of a program in which they can actually function in their life serving the Lord Jesus Christ in true godliness. See, godliness is not you trying to obey and do these things. It's you letting Christ live his life through you. And that's what evangelism really is all about. Turn to Acts chapter 14. There's the three points here I want to go over with you. Acts chapter 14, Paul is going to show you, or actually Luke is going to show you, this little outline. Look at uh, Acts 14, 21. Things don't happen by chance. You make those decisions. Your opportunity is here, and you need to take that opportunity to heart. Okay? Now, Acts chapter 14, verse 21. Acts chapter 14, and look at verse 21 through, we're going to look at uh, uh, 21, 22, and 23. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And look at verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended themselves, uh, commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after that, and after they had passed uh, throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And you see all this work that's being done in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is just, it's just this huge missionary effort by Paul. After Acts chapter 9, that's all it is. It's just a run from chapter 9 to 28 about the entire... Where are all the other people in the book of Acts? Where's Peter at? Where's the 11 with Peter? Where are the 12 apostles? I mean, they had 12 apostles over here. Judas hung himself. Over here, they chose another apostle. He gets killed in Acts 12. They don't replace him. So what do you got? You got no activity. Their program's canceled. Their, their program is literally postponed. And what happens is when you come to the end of the book of Acts and you're reading all this stuff, you go, it dawns on you in Acts 28. You go, where's Peter's program? Where's, what's happening with Peter? What's happening with the other program? You're finding now that there's more than one program, and now you want to know what's happened to the other one? Romans is the explanation to that. 
It's the Magna Carta for the body of Christ is what it is. It's the, it's the, it's the, the document that gives the body of Christ its power to go out into the world system and do what it's supposed to do, and yet it's not that the church, the body of Christ, doesn't know where Romans is. It refuses to read Romans. What it wants to do is follow Rome instead of follow Romans. It wants to go out there and follow Rome. And don't, don't kid yourself. The Protestants that protested against Rome broke away because of the grace of God and they got saved and so forth, but where are they at now? They broke, them, they broke themselves away from Rome, and then what'd they do? They come full circle, they come right back up against Rome, and now they're right beside them doing exactly the same thing they're doing in spades. Only worse, Rome has always been Rome. Rome has always stood for what they believed. Rome has always said, this is what we say. But the Protestants are splintered, and they're, they're, they're a group of isms and schisms that cannot decide what they know and believe, and they can't take on Rome. You would think if what they believed in the 13, 14, 1500s was, was really strong in them, that they would have annihilated Rome and, and done away with them. But they didn't. They're a billion strong today, and I'm going to tell you, there's a big clash coming. And that clash is going to be between Rome and Islam. It's going to be between the humanists and the Hindus, and it's going to be with the Protestants. They're going to be in there right neck and neck fighting with all of them because none of them can agree on what is going on. They don't even know who their apostle is. I asked a man, do you know who your apostle is? I didn't even know I had one. I said, well, you do. You got one. Now, if he's called to be an apostle, He's got a job to do. What does Paul say about his apostleship and about his responsibility to preach the gospel? He says, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. <laughs> woe unto me. I don't think he's talking about being punished by the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm th I think he's talking about losing his opportunity. I think he's talking about having an opportunity and not taking it. I think he's talking about an opportunity that was given to him that was so fantastic that he decided in his life what he was going to do. It's like Joshua, a very similar guy. Joshua says back here, after Moses dies, he says, choose this day whom you shall serve. And he says, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I used to have that on my wall. And uh, I remember looking at that verse, and it starts out with, as for me. And then it says, and my house. So my house is to follow me, Okay. And as you lead your house and as you lead your family and as you lead your friends and relatives and neighbors and all the people that come to you for assistance and help and counsel, you've got to lead them in the right direction. And when you run up against a guy on the street who's lost, you better do what? You better lead him to Christ and not to some other message. Because when you deal with a man and you give him the wrong message, what's going to happen? He might believe it. And if he believes it, what happens? He might go to hell too. Because wrong messages have wrong destinations. Matter of fact, uh, it's interesting that, that the only message in your Bible from beginning to end that takes you straight to heaven, I'm not interested in a Roman message that takes me through hell to get into heaven. Uh, not at all, okay? There is no such thing as purgatory or limbo, all right? And yet they preach it. And yet today, when you get saved, where do you go? So well, I'm going to go to heaven. No, you're not going to go to heaven. You're already there as soon as you trust him. Paul says we're seated with him in the heavenly places. So if you find yourself under the sun and you're lost and you get saved, the minute you get saved, you find yourself above the sun in Christ Jesus. And now you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, if you don't know what they are, you're operating with a great disadvantage. One of the rules in evangelism, as we go through this idea of evangelism, edification, and expansion, if you'll notice, they preach the gospel to them, okay, then they edify them and build them up, as you see the pattern there in Acts, and then they establish new churches after that. So it's always first you preach the gospel. You never talk about biblical subjects and other doctrines with lost people. Why? Because the Bible spiritually discerned. 
And I know what happens when these people try to wrap you around the axle. You want to you, you get your sword out and you want to parlay with them. But you're not to be parlaying with them to show them how good you are with your sword. What you're supposed to do is do some spiritual surgery right quick and try to get right to the meat of the matter. Get to their heart and get to that issue that they have not settled with their religious system because religious systems don't settle this. The only thing that settles this is the cross of Calvary right there in the blood of Jesus Christ, and there isn't any other way around it. So Paul says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And so we have a mandate that preach. It's for us to preach to lost people is to start by preaching the gospel of grace. Preach the gospel first. Look at Romans chapter 16. I showed you that verse in, in 1 5. You see that one, right? The obedience of faith for all nations. Okay, look at Romans 16. He does the same thing at the end of Romans, right? It's to all nations for the obedience of faith, verse 26. But go up into verse 25 and notice how he divides up the work of the ministry in the edification of the believer. The entire edification process of the believer begins right here. Look at this, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Now if you go back to Romans 1, and we showed you this I think maybe last week or a week before, the establishment in verse 11 it has an E on the front of it, establish. Whereas this one has the word establish. Now, it's like when I go up against a word like example, for instance, 1 Thessalonians, we'll look at that in a second. There's an example. You say, I don't understand what you're saying. Give me an example. How many of you have ever done that? If I give you an example, I'm going to give you an illustration of what it is you've got to do. And then when you still keep going, I don't know what you're talking about. What am I going to do? I'm going to show you. Have you ever done that with somebody? Let me show you. I've had kids try to do things two or three times. They don't get it. I said, just, just do it slow. Nah, they mess it up. And you say, hey, let me show you how to do that. And you've got to do it. Okay? And then sample is a living example of somebody who got the example, okay? They got it, they got the doctrine, now they're living it. So go see the example of that. See? That's the difference. So when he goes through here and he says, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, that's a person who's not just established in the basics, that's a person who's now established like an oak tree with with tap roots 25 feet down, immovable. You see a tree out there, and it's, it's in the ground, and they got the, the lines coming off of it. We had a guy, it was funny, we had a guy across the street from us one time where we live now, and he had roots coming up in his yard from this tree, and he cut those roots. And we had a storm come up, and the tree was down. You can't cut the roots when they're going out. The, the roots of a tree go out all the way out to how far the bough goes out. So when the bough goes out to here, the roots will be there too. And they'll extend past that. A tree's root base is bigger than its bough. You just don't see it. So in order for that thing to, to stay stabilized, it's got to have tap roots way down, footers that are drawing the water up, and then it's got to have these roots out here spread out, and they're hunting for water. I pulled a root that big from my house the other day. It was going along the side of my house, and there was a water problem I've been dealing with, and, and there's a root crawling all the way across. It's from the oak tree out in the front of my yard. It's a live oak, and it's got a, it's got a, a, a root that's coming. On. It's not even underground hardly, and it's going all the way across. You know why it's there? Because there's water leaking over there. It's searching out for the water, and when it finds the water, it's going to go down and try to find more. It's, it's seeking establishment. And when a person gets established and they go through that process and then they get established, what happens next? They're growing to establishment, finalization. In other words, maturity. Okay? Not just somebody who's learning it, but somebody who has learned it, who is teaching it, who is moving forward with it, who is planting more churches, who is leading people to cry. All these things by example. These are your goals in life. Your goal in life isn't to come to church every Sunday. Your goal in life is to learn the material so that you can go out and do the work of the ministry. Sunday is to help you do that. And Wednesday nights and any other night that you go or have 
Bible study. You should be doing that on your own. Uh, he says, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So the revelation of the mystery given to Paul, this revelation, which was a series of revelations, that's the whole message. But what does it start with there? What's the first thing? Now to him that is of power to establish you according to what? He says what? My gospel. When he talks about my gospel, he means the gospel that I've been given that has to do with what I'm preaching about the gospel of Christ. Now, it's got a lot of different names. You can call, it's called the mystery of the gospel. That's the mystery aspect of it. It's called the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20. It's called the, uh, the, the gospel of Christ. It's called the gospel. It's called my gospel. Go through Paul's epistles and look up the word gospel every instance and read every verse, and you will see that the gospel termination, that the terminology for the gospel has as many shades as we have colors. It's just talked about in so many different aspects. When he talks about the mystery of the gospel, he's talking about not that the gospel's a secret, he's talking about that it's part of the secret that was given to him. See, the secret is this. Here's the secret. The secret isn't that the Gentiles are going to get saved. That's no secret. That's Abrahamic covenant. That's prophesied. Now you see why, go back to Romans 1, you see in Romans 1 there's a parenthesis there. In Romans chapter 1, he says, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news of God in every age, no matter what it was, whether it was the gospel given to Abraham or Moses or any of them, those messages were all ultimately centered on this issue right here. It was all future. 4,000 years, all future. 2,000 years later, it's all past for us. We preach a message that's past. Okay? Now, this whole thing about the mystery is not violated in Romans 1, 2. It's confirmed because verse 2 says, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. He's talking about the general messages of the general good news that he gave to certain individuals to get them along their way as they're moving forward in this progressive plan. But when he gets to the final thing here, it's the cross of Calvary. And even after that happened, nobody here knew what was going on until Christ gave it to Paul. Who better to explain that than him? You see what I'm saying? So as you see that being explained here, you begin to say, oh, okay, so who's going to explain it to these guys? Well, read your Bible. Paul did. He explained it to all of them. Well, he didn't explain it to Stephen. Stephen was dead, but he explained it to Peter and James and John. As a matter of fact, they had a contract and shook on it, and they all agreed that, okay, Paul, you're the guy now. They gave their plan up. They didn't have a plan anymore. As a matter of fact, many of those kingdom saints, Barnabas and uh, Silas were two of them, that, that realized what was going on, and they followed Paul, and they helped Paul in the work of the ministry. Many of those guys did. Because their program was over, but they, their lives were not over. So what did they do? They said, well, what are we going to do? We can't just eat worms and die. We've got to do something. We're in the program. So what, is they, what do they do? They help Paul what? Carry on the work of the ministry. If you remember, the, the, I call Barnabas, he's an apostle, by the way. Acts 13 will tell you that. He's an apostle also, but I call him the liaison apostle because one of his chief jobs was to introduce Paul and sell the apostles on the issue of Paul is not Saul anymore. Okay, He was Saul, now he's Paul. He's not the killer that we once knew. He's not the person who destroyed 20,000 of our people. He's not the person who's out to, to be the enemy of Jesus Christ. He is who he is. And all they have is his word and stories about him. They didn't get the revelation from Jesus Christ. They didn't get the memo on that. And so for 14 years, Paul operates out in the Gentile territories in, in almost total obscurity. He has no contact with those people, very little. Only in the very beginning and then, then later on in Acts 15 we see what happens. See, it all had to be explained. Well, here it is, 2012, September, and I'm still explaining it. And so are you, okay? Because it needs to be explained. 
it is a gospel message that was a forepromised by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, and it is concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm telling you right now, when Jesus Christ, in, in his pre-incarnate form, dealt with Abraham, and he talked to him, and he preached before the gospel unto Abraham, and God talked to him back there about this being the father of, of this new nation and this nation going out into the world and bringing all the nations back to God and doing all this. And, and, and Abraham looks for a city whose founder and maker is God, and he's looking for all this, and he's going to do it. And in these shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It isn't going to happen through the, the glorious grand plan of the nation of Israel doing this on their own because they had 1,500 years to do it and they didn't do it. They killed Christ. It's going to be done by a new group of people over here who is part of that family, who make up that family, but something's going to happen to them that's going to allow them to do that. And he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob. This one didn't work because they, it, they didn't get it. It was given to restrain their evil and it was given to condemn their sin, but they took it as a religious to-do list and it ended up making them religious people who, by the way, are the most dangerous people on the planet. Okay, And so as you see they're, they're, how dangerous they were, they kill God. Nobody has that exclusivity anymore. The record stands with them. So when he deals with the nation of Israel over here, after he kills two-thirds of them in the tribulation period, he's going to take that little remnant after they find themselves backed up in the valley of Megiddo and all the nations of the earth, most of them, are gathered together to exterminate them once and for all. They've been trying the whole time to do it. Here they're going to they're gonna try to pull that off. Jesus Christ comes back and he saves them in the time of Jacob's trouble. And he plants in their hearts. He gives them a new heart. And he causes them to walk in the statutes. He gives them this spiritual power that they've never had under a law-based system. He gives them the power to do what they need to do to be the nation they need to be. He's already given us that right here today. We got it. We've already received it. Our dispensation of grace ends. It ends. Just like the Vietnam War ended. Everybody getting hauled out. And the rest of the people left. They've been capitalizing on that idea with the Left Behind series. I don't know if you've ever watched that. That's the most ridiculous, convoluted thing I've ever seen in my life. But it do, what it does, it, it does say this. Something's coming, okay? And when, and when it comes... You find yourself standing there going, Our Father who art in heaven, you know, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're gone. That's not the kingdom come. That's the body go. That's what that is. So the kingdom's going to come, yes, according to prophecy. But before that happens, the church, the body of Christ, is going to be taken out. It's going to be taken to uh, the heavenly places. You're going to be given a brand new body. And then he's going to talk to you about, okay, what gospel did you preach? What did you do to edify my saints? How many new churches did you help establish? And then there's going to be some excuses. <laughs> but there won't be any time to give them. Because I don't think we're going to talk during that time to you. Do you usually talk in front of the judge? <laughs> no. You know, Jesus Christ is not going to condemn anybody for sin or judge anybody for sin. What he's going to do is he's going to review your service is what he's going to do. Have you ever had a performance review at work? My wife gets one every year at work. I give myself one every year too. And I always fail it for some reason. <laughs> it's pretty bad when you fail your own performance review, don't you? But I, sometimes I go easy on myself, you know. But my wife, she can't do that. She's got to fill out all this paperwork and she's got to go sit with the boss and she's got to do all these things. And they've got to review her performance. God's going to review your performance, and that review will determine exactly what you do in the heavenly places for eternity. Not whether you get there or not. You're already there. As soon as you hear the horn, you're there, okay? But the issue, as a matter of fact, you're there now, like I said, but this is the reality of going. You're there positionally now. But right, right at that point, you're going to be there in reality. And what you do in eternity as far as I can tell, doesn't get retracted. It doesn't get changed. You're going to be put into a position that best suits you. Let me put it to you this way. 
if you go and swim every day, and you swim the mile, and you swim two miles, and you learn the lifeguard training, and you study all that stuff, and you go through it like they do in the Coast Guard. Those, those guys in the Coast Guard are fantastic. And they go out in the ocean, and they, they save people's lives. They swim. I mean, these are swimmers. But before they do that, they practically drown every one of those guys. It's like a Navy SEAL. They, they take them down below, and they, they bring them up, and they're passed out. They try to revive them. It's amazing how much punishment they have to go through before they realize that they're ready to go do this job. So what he's going to judge you on up here is not your sin. That's already been taken care of at Calvary. You wouldn't be there if he was going to do that. The issue here is the service and the capacity in which you're going to have to serve. Just like a resume shows a, an, an employer the capacity that you have to serve him and to work for him, this time in your life is your opportunity to serve. The first time I ever heard this, it scared the wee jeebies out of Russ. You know why? Because Russ was living like Solomon. You can be smarter than Solomon. You don't have to be wise in your own conceits. You do not have to be all big-headed about what you're doing in life. What you need to do is humble yourself and say, Okay, Lord, I'm ready to stop thinking about what I want to do in life. And I want to find out what you want me to do. You know... When you're 18, 19 years old and you're, you're ready to launch out into the world, man, you got, you got everything. You know, I was telling my wife this morning, when we were young, everybody wanted to be hip. I said, right now, I just want a new hip. <laughs> you know? I've been hobbling around on my knee. I hurt my knee, and then, then I've been limping on it, and been limping on it. Now it's hurting my hip. I'm going, it's just working its way up, you know? It's terrible. And, and you, you, you realize that, that when you're young, you just you look like you got the whole world in front of you, and you've got everything in front of you. But remember, time and chance back there. You don't know when your number's up. Because there is no number. God's not up there with a lottery ball with your name on it. Okay, it's time to bring him home. While you're sitting there thinking about this, this is the posture of our young people today. Boom! You get the bus hit you, okay? And all of a sudden, you're gone, and what's gone with you? Your opportunity is gone. Don't think. Don't think that you have your whole life ahead of you to serve the Lord. You want to serve every day, and you want to live every day just like he's coming back today. And you want to plan in the future just like he won't be back for another hundred years. I met a man this week, 96. He said, how old do you think I am? I said, uh, 80, 85. He said, 96. And he did not look 96. And then I thought about him driving around at 96. He couldn't hear. He brought a speaker in for me to fix, and he, he said it was broke. I hooked it up. It worked perfectly, <laughs> and he couldn't hear it, and he had huge ears, larger than mine, and he couldn't hear it, and he, and, and he said, oh, I thought it wasn't working. I said, no. I was like, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you're the one that's not working, okay? <laughs> Happens all the time. People say, I got hearing aids. I don't know if I should get these or not. Don't buy these speakers. It doesn't do any good. I said, why bother? <laughs> need some headphones is what you need. You know, it doesn't do any good. People get old, they die. But some people don't get old. And they don't have that opportunity. They lose it. And what happens is they, they miss the opportunity. And the opportunity that we have to go out and preach the gospel is not going to be taught to you by legalism or extortion. On this study sheet, I put here, overcoming excuses by learning the truth. If you can read the verses in these 12 points, you will see that you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Your vocation is very clear. You're now a soldier with a mission. You are motivated by the grace of God to go do this. You are not to live unto yourselves. You are to live a godly life of sanctification as a testimony so you can be that and sample to everyone. 
We've not been given the spirit of fear or of shame, but of love. We've been given a sound mind. We've been given a spirit of power to go do this. We've been given a message with power. We will give an account of our service. And we are to read and study the word of God every day. We're to preach the gospel, not talk about it. And we are to do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of our ministry. And we are to preach the gospel of Christ only. Understanding the will of God. This man Thursday I spoke to was talking about trying to find out. It's classic conversation. Started out at 2 o'clock, ended at 5.30. And I was very thankful that it was slow that afternoon. And I, 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 normally I'm not too thankful about that. <laughs> but I was. No interruptions. And we talked and talked and talked. And he talked about learning the will of God. Understanding the will of God is available to you and very easy because it's already been revealed. Obeying the will of God requires faith in this revelation of grace and the resolve to go out and fight like a soldier. Turn to Colossians chapter 4, we'll close. You have your orders. The question is, will you carry them out? If you've ever seen the movie... Um, go to Colossians chapter 4. If you've ever seen the movie The Untouchables with Sean Connery, at the end when he gets shot, he gets shot up, he's dying. He's laying on the floor. And his buddy is there who he's been training and help him, helping him uh, learn about this kind of work. He's a policeman. And as he's, he's, he's down kneeling over him, and Sean Connery, before he dies, he's bleeding to death from these gunshot wounds, and he says, He's, he says the same thing he's been saying throughout the whole movie. What are you prepared to do? And when you see this in, in the scriptures, you have to ask yourself, what is God telling the Apostle Paul to do that he's not telling me to do? Because when he leaves you these epistles and he makes these epistles available to you, stop and think why it is that he left them for you. Not to look at Paul and say, wow, Paul was a great guy. He evangelized the entire known world of his day in a single generation by himself, on foot, in boat, in donkey, and whatever other means he had. And he did it, and, he did, and, he, and he, when he got done, he says, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. He fought a good fight, he said. He's, the, he's, a, he's a great example to us by being an example, by actually doing it, and we have it. Look at Colossians chapter 4. Paul mentions Epaphras here, a person who had gotten saved at Colossae and had gone into the work of the ministry with Paul. Verse 12, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, one of the Colossians, a servant of Jesus Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Notice what he says that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's written by inspiration, and it's designed to teach you that you can stand perfectly and complete in all the will of God. You just have to learn where it is. Now, one more verse, and we'll stop. I forgot this one, and I can't do this message without it. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you want to know what the will of God is, all you got to do is look at the verses. Ephesians chapter 1 will be a great place to start. But uh, we always use this verse as a jumping off, uh, like a, a springboard into just about every message we've ever preached here. You know, <laughs> I use this verse constantly. God's will is what? What is his will? Verse 4, 1 Timothy 2, 4. Who will have all men to be saved. Would you all agree with that? I would. I'd agree with you if you said it. Who will have all men to be saved, and then what? And come to the knowledge of the truth. First you get them saved, then you get them edified, then you get them organized, and you go out and expand, okay? That's the way it's done. And that's what evangelism is supposed to do, is to produce more saints in the body of Christ. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll stop. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who came to do for us what needed to be done, that we may be able to have a message to preach and a life to live. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Okay.